uh, welcome to ra online today's session uh, will be on uh, external ventricular drains and uh, intracranial pressure monitoring systems which are uh, very key in uh, neurocritical care and management of uh, neurotrauma patients so a brief history and uh, something about the lundberg's waves will be interesting to see before we actually go into the technique of putting in an external ventricular drain till 1965 there was no good intracranial pressure monitoring system and this was all possible because uh, lindberg came up with uh, an ventricular fluid based uh, pressure monitoring system in uh, severe traumatic brain injury patients it was through this landmark article through which uh, intracranial pressure monitoring became a regular setup in uh, neurotrauma neurocritical care uh, setups so he described three wave forms as you can uh, see in this diagram which uh, in the first diagram you can see lundberg's a waves which are actually nothing but icp wave forms with a pressure going up to 50 more than 50 usually and they usually last more than 10 minutes as you can see in this diagram they last for longer durations and uh, the icp here goes up to um, sometimes greater than 50 mm hg so these are lundberg's a waves which are definitely pathological and uh, usually indicate a very poor prognosis in patients especially those with severe traumatic brain injury lundberg b waves are those with pressures varying up to 20 to 30 mm hg sometimes they may be going up to more than 30 also but they last for a very short time 1 to 2 minutes so they last only for a few minutes and the pressures are definitely lesser than 50 the exact value of these uh, uh, in the clinical settings is not known but lundberg b waves are also definitely seen in uh, patients with severe traumatic brain injury lundberg c waves are nothing but normal wave forms which uh, vary between 10 to 20 mm hg which is normal uh, intracranial pressure and they last 1 to 2 minutes and they usually uh, vary based on the cardiac and respiratory cycle so they they can be considered normal icp wave forms so if we consider a normal icp wave there are three notches which you see p1 p2 and p3 so basically p1 represents the arterial pulsation or the systolic pressure during the highest systolic pressure we'll have a p1 wave and then p2 actually represents what happens during the a uh, normal uh, respiratory cycle so normal respiratory cycle there is a variation in the icp wave forms because of which there is a p2 notch this p2 notch in turn also represents the brain tissue compliance so sometimes this brain tissue compliance especially in traumatic brain injury reduces we have an abnormal wave form where p2 will go higher up compared to p1 and p3 so what is this p3 p3 is nothing but the uh, dichrotic wave which is nothing but the closure of the aortic valve so you have a wave form because there is a closure of the aortic valve and this is the normal icp wave form so whenever the p2 goes above the p1 and p3 we know that brain compliance is compromised and uh, the p1 p2 ratio if it is reversed is a very sensitive predictor of poor brain compliance so this is a basic understanding of the waveforms the waveforms are usually seen in the multi monitor uh, system but uh, certain settings icp we go by the actual pressure and uh, when the pressure whenever it goes above 20 we know that it's abnormal and we take certain measures to bring down the intracranial pressure so what is what will be an ideal uh, intracranial pressure monitor that which causes minimal trauma during placement that which has low risk for infection because this is going to be in place for at least 24 to 48 hours sometimes uh, we may use it even for 5 days so and uh, during the placement of the icp or while it's being while the icp is being monitored there should be no csf leak and uh, all icp monitors will be handled by uh, paramedical staff after its placement so it necessarily needs to be easy to handle and easy to uh, monitor whenever it goes abnormal and it should be reliable so that uh, we understand which icp wave forms uh, pressure settings which are uh, which are read by the monitor are abnormal and this should be reproducible in different settings when we uh, use the same technique and uh, ideally this should be able to function whenever a various uh, diagnostic or a therapeutic procedure is also done maybe we should uh, ideally be able to monitor even after a decompressive craniectomy is done uh, 
so and uh, an ideal icp monitor is also one which is not only diagnostic but also provides a therapeutic option suppose you have an external ventricular drain which acts as an ideal icp monitor so we can also vent csf through the external ventricular drain which uh, gives us an uh, therapeutic option and the pressure range that it can measure should be between 0 to 100 mmhg with an accuracy of 2 mmhg especially in the range between 0 to 20 which uh, the usual normal icp values are so what are the types of uh, modern icp monitor you can broadly classify them into invasive and non invasive an invasive uh, icp monitor which is most commonly used is an external ventricular drain and this is considered as the gold standard because it accurately measures the intracranial pressure and also provides a therapeutic option as I mentioned in my previous slide. So intraparenchymal fiber optic or a mini HS strain gauge ICP monitor is also one more option which is commonly used in the neuro ICU settings. This is because an intraparenchymal mo monitor is easier to place and uh, the other option is also to place subdurally. So both these give the option of placing it with uh, less problems because an external ventricular drain has a chance that 20 percent will have a mal, uh, malplacement. So intraparenchymal or a subdural placement does not require so much of expertise as compared to an external ventricular drain. Apart from this intraparenchymal monitors can also uh, measure the SpO2 levels in the brain. So the brain tissue oxygenation can be measured. Apart from this the brain pH can also be measured. Lactate levels are also measured with these intraparenchymal monitoring systems uh, which are usually fiber optic or uh, they also use a miniature strain gauge to measure the actual uh, intracranial pressure. The last and the most uh, recent ones is uh, telemetric ICP monitoring which is not used in the ICU setting but used telemetrically very similar to a halter monitor which is used to measure any ECG changes. In telemetry the patient is mobile and we use, usually use this in uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus settings where we need to know how the intracranial pressure is changing and we can also use these uh, recordings to compare with the patient's clinical symptoms whether the headache or the symptoms of the patients are worsening with the worsening ICP waveforms and we can correlate clinically and the ICP data. Um, this is not very commonly done in the Indian setting. Um, since uh, invasive ICP monitoring has its risks especially of hemorrhage, malplacement, infection, non-invasive modes of uh, ICP monitoring are uh, getting a huge uh, push in these in the, especially the uh, 2010s and to 2020s we rely on ONSD the optic nerve sheet diameter which is a non-invasive method of serially monitoring the intracranial pressure. So we will get into detail about non-invasive monitoring also but three other ways uh, which were tried and some centers even try even now are venous ophthalmo dynamometry, cochlear uh, fluid pressure and transcranial Doppler. So basically just as we know that the ear and the eye are nothing but the eyes of the brain. So we can have, they are basically the windows of the brain. So we can have ways to look into the brain through both the ear and the eye. So ONSD is a technique where we use the uh, optic nerve sheath diameter to roughly measure the intracranial pressure. So moving on to external ventricular drain placement. So this is commonly placed in uh, placed in an emergency setting when the patient comes with a hydrocephalus and uh, the patient's uh, sensorium is uh, low. We tend to place an external ventricular drain as an emergency procedure. This is also done uh, electively to measure intracranial pressure in neurotrauma, especially in the patients who have uh, severe traumatic brain injury and uh, their scan has uh, abnormal findings. So these are the very common indications for uh, external ventricular drains. So as we understand that it is an emergency setting and the patient is quite sick, this has to be done bedside. So the ideal venue of a external ventricular drain placement, placement is bedside. But there are studies which have read whether the infection rates come down by uh, placing the EVD in a procedure room or it can be done only in the ICU or it can be done only in the OR. But ultimately if we see all these studies the venue of external ventricular drain placement does not really matter 
if it's an emergency procedure it has to be done bedside and after ensuring uh, appropriate sterility that we usually do for uh, any in invasive uh, procedure. So, the entry point marking and positioning are also very important. Uh, this is done after the patient uh, has been positioned usually in supine with 30 degree head and elevation we give. So, this is the positioning of the patient and the entry point is marked based on this diagram. So, if you see this is the midline. So, we will first mark the midline and we palpate for the coronal suture. So, the entry point is based on the caucus point which is 1 centimeter just anterior to the coronal suture and 3 centimeters lateral to the midline. So, we are 3 centimeters away from the midline and 1 centimeter anterior to the coronal suture. So, the entry point and the trajectory will be better explained in the upcoming slides with the help of a video. And then uh, once the external ventricular drain is placed, we uh, tunnel the external ventricular drain to reduce the risk of infection. A minimum of 5 centimeter of tunneling is required to reduce the chance of uh, infection. The infection that we are mentioning here is uh, meningitis and ventriculitis, both of which can be life threatening. Then after the tunneling is done, we connect to a pressure monitor and also we also have a three uh, three way stop cock system to ensure that we can also vent some CSF in case the pressures go up. So, what are the usual things required uh, for the placement of an external ventricular drain? We need a 11 blade uh, surgical knife and then uh, we will need local anesthetic usually with adrenaline um, and uh, we need uh, to have uh, a drill. This can be a mechanized drill or a um, manual drill uh, which can be used and with drill bits uh, so that we can make a burr hole through the cranial vault. And then uh, we need a VP needle to check whether the dura has been breached or not. And we can also tap the ventricle based on the uh, uh, preoperative CT markings. We can even plan how much depth you should be going in to hit the ventricle. So, we need a VP needle to tap and uh, once the uh, ventricle is tapped, we insert the long ventricular catheter. Or if the long ventricular catheter in most centers uh, are costly, low resource setting setups can use a double sterilized infant feeding tube. So, this double sterilization technique is uh, relatively uh, a cheaper variation, but there is no uh, risk of increased chance of infection in when we use a double sterilized infant feeding tube. And then we will need a 3O ethylon or some suture material to uh, secure the external ventricular drain after placing it usually at 5 to 6 centimeters at the level of the outer table or at the level of the skin, it should be around 5 to 6 centimeters and we should ensure that this does not move and it is uh, securely fastened securely with a 3O ethylon or some uh, suture material. Uh, this uh, once the EVD is tunneled, it is connected to a CSF collecting bag or a ICP monitoring system and finally, everything is ensured that it continues to remain sterile by applying a tegaderm or an op site. Now, a short animation video which will demonstrate the trajectory and entry point of a external ventricular drain. Usually, we uh, insert the external ventricular drain in the right frontal region. Uh, we prefer the right side because on the left side, we if there is a hematoma formation of there, there is a malplacement, there is an increased risk of the patient developing aphasia. Uh, strictly keep anterior to the coronal suture in order to avoid the motor cortex which is usually around 5 centimeters behind the coronal suture and uh, usually this marking which is done here is along the mid pupillary line which will be usually uh, around 3 centimeters from the midline. So, this should be 3 centimeters from the midline and we remain 1 centimeter anterior to the coronal suture. This will be our entry point. Now, uh, to look at the trajectory. So, the trajectory in the mediolateral plane is directed towards the nasion or the ipsilateral medial canthal line. So, as we had seen uh, the entry point is anterior to the coronal suture and the VP needle is inserted in such a way that the direction in the mediolateral plane is towards the nasion or the ipsilateral medial canthus. I usually prefer to stick to the medial canthus because there is a chance that uh, we may hit the opposite ventricle by uh, trying a more medial trajectory. So, in the anteroposterior plane, we usually aim it towards the tragus as you can see in this 
second diagram and finally we connect it to a icp monitor so that we can have a measurement of the intracranial pressure so what are the ways to reduce infection rates one method is to do an extended tunneling the more you tunnel uh, there is a lesser chance of infection but the minimum distance to be tunneled is at least 5 cm so we should ensure that 5 cm of the external ventricular drain tube uh, which is usually an infant feeding tube or a long ventricular catheter is tunneled for at least 5 cm so this is a definite way of reducing infections and usually we can keep this external ventricular drain for 5 days some surgeons believe in giving a prophylactic antibiotics and prolonging the number of days the external ventricular drain or the intracranial pressure monitoring EBD ICP can remain in place. Uh, usually uh, ceftriaxone is given as an prophylactic antibiotic and uh, once ceftriaxone is given uh, we can probably extend the number of days we use this EBD but it is best practice to either exchange or recite the EBD to the other side in case there is a uh, suspicion of uh, increased risk of infection at the end of 5 days. So, no external ventricular drain should be in place for more than 5 days even with the use of prophylactic antibiotics. So, antibiotic use generally has made no difference uh, to the infection rates uh, related to external ventricular drains. Antibiotic impregnated catheters usually with uh, rifampin or minocycline can also be used to reduce the rate of uh, infection rates associated with these ICP monitors or external ventricular drains. So, what is uh, non-invasive uh, pressure monitoring? As I mentioned, optic nerve sheath diameters ONSD is uh, a very uh, upcoming way to measure the intracranial pressure. This is a non-invasive method as I have mentioned where an ultrasound probe uh, usually in B mode is placed on the uh, eye and uh, uh, we see the distance behind the globe to be at least 3 mm and behind this uh, behind this 3 mm we measure the distance here and this distance if it is more than 5 mm is considered abnormal in most settings there are uh, centers which consider 5.5 mm to 5.5 mm as normal and uh, this is the optic nerve diameter mentioned as OND and the second uh, line is ONSD which is the distance between the optic nerve sheaths. So, usually CSF will be flowing here and when there is increased pressure we obviously expect the optic nerve sheet diameter to widen. The biggest advantage of uh, ONSD is that it can be serially monitored and it is repeatable. So, we know that if the pressure is increasing so you can serially monitor and see if the ONSD is increasing and uh, at different points in time we can even correlate it sim with the patient's symptoms and uh, sensorium. So finally the biggest problem with ONSD is the inter observer variability because it is uh, highly operator dependent it can be uh, so, so that uh, two different observers have two different values which are usually different by a few mm. So, uh, to uh, understand and um, uh, perform ONSD in patients requires a lot of practice and experience in the clinical setting. Thank you.